future. What a complicated word. A word full of gravity, a word full of meaning, a word full of uncertainties. Why not pour in a bucket of potential disappointments? A word full of joblessness, which is potential. Why not throw in a bag of unknowns? The paranoia and the fear that grips me when I think of the word future and when I see it as ready as it is, is immense. So are many young people, millions of them across the globe, who are quite afraid of that word. What comes to your mind when you see the word future? Aha, you know what you might be thinking? Potential joblessness and unemployment? Bitcoin? The intensification of automation? Machine learning and teleporting? Uh, a presidential fleet of Tesla cars? A colony on Mars? Why not add a swarm of flying cars? If this is not what you think about the word future, this is what I think. And I know that I'm not alone. Many young people, when they see the word future, this is exactly what they think. But sadly, I don't know what the future holds. None of you does. That's the even, sad, that's, that's the even more sad part. So for us to know what the future holds, we need to ask the future itself. Because none of us knows what the future holds. But again, who talks to the future on Facebook Messenger, on WhatsApp, or Instagram? No one. But I will run a lot of our bag of tricks. But I have one in the pocket. And I'm here to help you interrogate the future, what she holds, and will she let the kid out of the bag? Well, we will find out. Maybe she might. So, it is very difficult for us to look at the future and analyze and ask the future what she holds without looking at the past. Because at one point in time, the past was once the future. Yes, it is very right and very correct to say yesterday was once the future who zoomed into the present and faded into the distant past. What did she hold? Now, before I answer that question, let me address why I refer to the past and the future as she. It's because the past is taking care of us like a mother. So I will the future because we will be living in her. So for us to look at what the future holds, we're looking at the past. So this is Metropolis in 1927, the first inception of automation. And you might be wondering why we are mentioning automation in this whole equation. Automation is the number one job challenge that the young people of today are afraid of. And that is the number one job challenge that people in the future were afraid of as well. So we're going to look at the effects of automation on joblessness or employment as purported by young people of today or as thought by many um, job analysts of today. So this was the first inception of automation. And automation is simply the process of improving industrial processes and production with little or no human manual input. So this was Metropolis, and we see that there's a robot, we see that there's a human being, ETC. So we move down to the 1930s. In the 1930s, machines started taking over human labor. And in this article, Someone was exclaiming, and he was marveling at technology, saying that in roadworks, a motor mixer was much faster, it was mixing mortar and tar at an intensity of unquantifiable velocity, and it was more efficient, more efficient than a human expert would do, or what the normal robot construction workers would do. Yeah, so it's quite impressive. This is a good result of technology. We move down again, the memory lane, into 1958. These were the 1958 uprisings against technology. You see long showmen, they were breaking technology, smashing many things and destroying because it was taking over their employment and their jobs. Don't worry if you don't know what long showmen are because it is because many of them have uh, failed to dodge the powerful blow of technology on the effects of jobs and employment. And technology was taking it too far to the extent that Dr. Jeff Kennedy the President of the United States of America. In 1962, before he was assassinated uh, two years later, he said that 
Um, automation was now the number one job challenge. Yeah. So he ranks automation as the number one job challenge. So automation was taking it too far. But still, the world didn't run out of work, and we'll see that uh, how. Even though many people were laid off, 11 million plus farm workers, telephone operators, travel agents, railway workers, many of them were laid off. But still, the world didn't run out of work. How? So work persists, it persists, it persists. We're going to see that in this trend from the international area of uh, level statistics. So as we can see, this is US unemployment. And we discovered that, uh, uh, we discovered that employment rose gradually from the 1950s towards 2010, increasingly, even though technology was making some jobs redundant. And this is more of a paradox and it's very controversial because we discovered that we expect that when people are losing their jobs, employment goes down as well. But employment was going up. And at one point in time, it stayed high, above 80% in a standing majority, of course, in the absence of recessions. So this is the similar explanation. We're going to see that that's a blue icon, which signifies new technology. To the far right corner, we discovered that there are new jobs, there are jobs that are lost as a result of technology. Now, if you move towards my right, you discover that due to new technology, we're going to need new technology suppliers. When you have new technology suppliers, that means we, they're going to hire more and more people who are going to supply technology and make hardware, etc. That means a job that has been created. We will discover that again, with new technology, that's a new industry, the quarter industry, which is not yet quite present and common in developing countries. So with the new industries, new jobs. Now, with new technology, there's going to be higher productivity, uh, companies are going to lower their prices, people are going to buy more, and when customers buy more, that means the producers are stimulated to uh, produce beyond their productive capacities, so they have to increase their labor, uh, which is uh, a key effect of production. When they increase that, that means they are hiring more labor. That means more jobs. So as we can see that with one job lost due to, technology, to new technology, we have three more. So it is hard to lose your job as a result of technology. But it is a lot harder to find the jobs that come as a result of new technology. It doesn't mean that these jobs will be located in the same place, paying the same money, or be demanded the same, depending on which context we are talking about, and depending on the time. So this is what is going to bring us to the core of our discussion. In the core of our discussion, we're going to uh, look at two questions. That's the first question. What jobs will dodge the powerful blow of technology and make it to the future? The second question is, what skills will matter in the future of work? And how can young people like me, who are quite paranoid about the future, be better prepared for it? Now, to answer the first question, I cannot tell you which jobs will be there in the future of work. Not you, not you, not you, my good sir. I don't think even a job expect to do that because a job is just a title. It's just a game of words. It's a game of semantics. But with every job, there's a skill that is underlying to it. And this is exactly what I'm here to talk about to help you see which skills you need to adapt to three new jobs that are going to be created by technology. So, this is me, 2008. I was uh, cute as well, uh, quite ignorant. I wouldn't mind calling myself that. This was during the global recession, 2008, and my parents were still billionaires. Yeah, so was more than half of the population of Zimbabwe. Private jetless billionaires, cashless billionaires, mansionless billionaires. So that doesn't sound too hyperbole. I'm going to explain the whole concept of rock billionaires. It's because during 2008, the reserve bank of Zimbabwe had too much money in circulation. And when they had too much money in circulation, that means the zeros of the notes increased until everyone was a millionaire. At one point in time, I was a trillionaire. Yeah, and I'm still here. And we discovered that the world has gone upside down and there was no end in sight to how poor the teapot nation of Zimbabwe would become. The normal thing is you go with money in the pocket to bring groceries in a bag or in a um, cardboard box. 
but you had to go with money in a cardboard box to bring groceries in the pocket. But I didn't care about that because I was ignorant and inefficient. All I cared about was simple arithmetic from my elementary school teacher, 1 plus 1, 2 plus 2, 3 plus 3. That's all I cared for, and that's why I cared. That's all I cared about. Let's fast forward to 2016. 2016, I was in Form 1, the arithmetic grew more and more complicated. Instead of 1 plus 1, it was 3 minus 5.7 divided by 100. I was quite uh, good at that. Form 3, I proceeded, and the arithmetic became more and more complicated, and it needed more uh, sophisticated tools, such as this calculator, which my mom bought me. This was my first ever calculator. It was the right view. And it was not as complicated. Well, it would compute 3 minus 5.7 divided by 100 with just a click of a button, which made it easier for me. I sailed through my all levels with this calculator that carried me through. Um, I passed my all levels. I was quite exceptional. My A is in 315 and 20, not to be too exact. I qualified for IB. I came for IB at Waterford. And when I had a first glimpse on my mathematics syllabus, I saw polynomials, binomials, quadratic functions, periodic tables, etc. And all of those things did not require such a calculator because the computing power is very low. So I had to leave it in preference for that Casio. It's Casio C5X50. It has high computing power. It can solve polynomials, binomials, and quadratic functions with just a click of a button and click of buttons. And yeah. This is quite it, and I'm comfortable using it. This is the first part of the story. Let's flip again to 2008. In 2008, my mom used to ask me when I was a kid, what do I need to do when I grew up? My answer was always simple, concrete, and uncontested. Ask your vendor. Yeah, you heard that right? Because I always thought that ask your vendors would give the ask at any time of the day as they pleased. And my mom was quite empathetic. She understood my nations and my ignorance. She was like, well, you shall become a nice inventor, surely as you wish. And now, last week, I was on a call with my mom. She was talking to me about life. She asked, son, what are your plans about the future? I said, this is the perfect moment to do my new experiment. I repeated the exact thing I said 14 years ago. I to inventor. My mom looked at me. I looked at her. She said, son, you are many things. That is not one of them. Because she was busy planning, and she put herself in my shoes, sympathized to say, with all the knowledge that I have accumulated, of the 14 years that I have been in a structured curriculum, I should have noticed that it doesn't work. Now, to link these two anecdotes, what is the big idea of the day? The big idea of the day is the, the arithmetic and the technical skills that I learned when I was in elementary school. They went, I was a mathematical genius, form one, but it became more and more complicated that the human mind could not just process at once, so it was substituted by technology. Before that calculator, was it a substituted by even better calculator? And I can also tell you that I can count the number of times that I've used the quadratic formula ever since I started learning it. Zero times, zero times, ladies and gentlemen. But I can tell you that the empathy that worked with my mom 14 years ago, it worked last week, and many other incidences. But sadly, skills such as empathy are underemphasized, undertaught, and undervalued as well, but we use them in our everyday lives. When I'm going up the stairs, I don't need to calculate, I don't need to calculate the Pythagoras theorem, I don't even use the Pythagoras theorem, but I use empathy. I look at the people around me, I consider them. So, what is the big idea? The big idea is, ever since I started going to school, there has been little or no emphasis in these skills, but time has proven that these skills have worked ever since time was a child, time was an infant, time was a virgin, time is taking care of us, now, right now, they are working. They are going to work when time is on a deathbed or when time is on a countdown to purgatory. they are going to work these skills. Because, look, you discover that these seven skills that I have been projected here clergy, leadership, and management of people, therapy, empathy, you discover that flexibility, those skills will be needed in the future of work. This is how they will be needed. Imagine, in terms of clergy and priests, someone 
like something like a robot telling you to repent from sin or you're going to die in hell. What what empathy does it know? What sin does it know? So these people will survive the powerful blow of technology. But of course they will come with different word formats or wordings or job titles, but these are the skills that are underlying. Flexibility, you need it to adapt to the three extra jobs that are going to be created by new technology, right? You also discover that, you know, in terms of therapy and psychology, imagine going for counseling, being counseled by a robot, a soulless charm of better with absolutely no empathy skills, telling you that if you don't change your attitude, you're going to die of depression in six months. That doesn't work, doesn't work well with me. Imagine a robot is your boss at work, telling you that you're fired. A soulless piece of metal telling you that you know, you're going to be fired if you don't work hard. What does it know? What empathy skills does it have? So, using logic, these skills will be demanded in the future of work, but they will be in different job titles. So I implore the International Baccalaureate Cambridge and other examination boards in the world to reboot their strategies, to reboot, to reboot their strategies, so that instead of focusing on IQ development, Young people can also be taught these fundamental skills in schools and in other workplaces so that you know, they are adaptable in the future of work. I can say that the only school that I have been to where they teach one of these skills, which is leadership and uh, management of people, is the Star Leadership Academy in Zimbabwe. And they are doing pretty well in that. And I wish that you know, many examination boards in the world rebooted their educational curriculums and incorporated these skills into their curriculums so that young people are not uh, forsaken and young people are able to adapt to the fast changing world. So will you continuously develop your IQ and forsake these skills that you need to plug at you so that you can adapt in the fast changing job economy and the job uh, market? Once you think about this, I leave you with this quote from my dad. Young people are not leaders of tomorrow, they are leaders of today. For it is an obligation of every young person of any nation to bring down oppression, economic strangulation, and social vices using the skills that I've said and raise banners of freedom. Peace.